Hello friends, welcome to Dr. Sai Physiology Academy, DOPA for short. This is the place where we make the learning of physiology easy, exciting and effective. Thank you for joining me. And if you're new to this channel, you're specially welcome. If you like the content that we share, kindly click the like button, the subscribe button and turn on notifications so you don't get to miss any content that we drop. All right. Thank you very much. So today we are going to be dealing with almost the last part of gastrointestinal physiology, digestion and absorption of what? Of the food, the nutrients that you're taking. Okay? So this is part one. We're going to be starting with that of the carbohydrate. But before we go ahead, let's just understand the basic principle of digestion and absorption. Now, Ask yourself if we ask you to define digestion, how will you define it? Will it be the breakdown of food substances into absorbable molecules? No. There is something very important that you must know about digestion because chewing is also the breakdown of food substance into smaller particles. Okay, but chewing is a physical breakdown. So digestion, in essence, it's a chemical, it's a chemical breakdown, okay? Even if you don't chew the food, there will still be some chemical breakdown. The only thing that chewing does, it increases the surface area for the chemicals to interact with each other. And chemicals are two things. You have enzyme, and substrate. So everything about digestion is dealing with an enzyme and a substrate. Okay? So now, when the enzyme acts on it, on its substrate, it breaks it down into smaller particles that are absorbable. So the digestive process the breakdown, it's like the opposite of the build-up. And that build-up, look at what happens. There are smaller components, molecules of the substance that come together. And one end of it has OH, the other end has H. So what the enzyme that joins them together, hmm? it removes the OH from one end and removes this H and it forms water. Then it now joins the two together in a process called condensation. So what happens in digestion is the opposite. It carries OH and H from water and it now joins, it first of all splits it and joins it back. So that process is called hydrolysis. So in essence, hmm, digestion is the hydrolysis of complex food substances. Just note that. Because we're going to be using this term, hydrolysis of this, hydrolysis of that. It happened in the three major food categories, classes, carbohydrate, protein, fats. The process of breakdown is the process of hydrolysis. All right? So that's by the way. So that's what happens in digestion. Now, what is the basic principle behind absorption? The food substance have been broken down into the smallest molecule, the smallest nutrient molecule. An example is glucose. So now what happens? Absorption is nothing complex. Once you know what goes on, it's easy for you to follow. It's just for you to know the steps. Picture it in your mind. Okay? Absorption is simply transport across cell membranes. Now, let me show you. It's just the opposite of secretion. Just go back to the lecture on basic mechanism of secretion and 
you will see how I explain it. The reverse of it. The secretion, the food substances, nutrients, they come from the blood. They cross the basement membrane. They enter through the basolateral membrane into the cell. And then synthesis happens and it's secreted through exocytosis into the lumen of the intestine. So absorption takes the opposite route. Okay? This is the cell. So you need to know about the lumen as there's a part of that cell. In this case, it's called the enterocyte. The enterocyte has two ends. This end of the cell is facing the lumen where the food substances are located. And of course, in the intestines, you have the microvilli. So this, the cells are there. Okay, so this other side is the basolateral membrane, which is close to the capillary, is the blood vessel. So what happens is that it, the food substances, they enter, they cross this apical membrane, also known as luminal membrane. They enter into the cell, the cytoplasm, and they move further and they cross this basolateral membrane okay this is called the basolateral membrane why this is called apica or luminal membrane right so it crosses this basolateral membrane enters this crosses this basement membrane, then crosses the capillary membrane and enters into the capillary. That is the process of absorption. Okay? So whenever you are talking about absorption of any substance, is to know what is the transport mechanism that it uses to cross the apical membrane. Number two, what is the transport mechanism that it uses to cross the basolateral membrane because most times they can be different. Okay? So it's to know each particular molecule. For example, in carbohydrate, there are different kinds of simple sugars. You know, glucose is the most common. But you still have galactose, the simple sugar, fructose. What process do they use? So that is simply what absorption is talking about. Although the one for fat is a little bit technical. When we get there, we'll talk about it. So this is the basic principle of absorption. We'll follow it as we talk about carbohydrates. So we're starting with carbohydrates now, okay? So let's start with the digestion of carbohydrates. So as we have said initially when we we're talking about salivary secretions, whenever you're talking about Always know the substrate and the enzyme and the location of that enzyme. That's all you need to when you're talking about digestion. Now, digestion of carbohydrates starts where? From the mouth. From the mouth, which is implemented by salivary amylase. Okay, it's called most of this enzyme they end with ACE. So it means that it is because carbohydrates, the plant carbohydrates is called amylopectin. Amylopectin plant sauce. Why the one for from animals, the starch. Okay, it's called A. Milos, as animal starch, usually come in the form of starch. So dietary carbohydrate comes in the form of starch or polysaccharides. But about 30 something percent of dietary carbohydrate come in the form of disaccharides. Okay? But mainly in the form of polysaccharides, starch. Polysaccharides. Okay, so that's what this salivary amylase does. 
it breaks down these polysaccharides into mainly maltose. From your biochemistry, these names should be familiar. Maltose is a disaccharide. Okay, it's a smaller unit. It breaks it through hydrolysis. So, what does it do? It breaks it to maltose. Mainly, that's what salivary amylase does. It does not go beyond that. So, when it does that, about 5% sometimes up to 10% of digestion already happens, this digestion to this stage happens in the mouth. But sometimes, before it gets to the stomach, up to 30 to 40% of the digestive process would have happened because of the time. Now, then the next thing is that it gets to the stomach and salivary amylase is totally deactivated. So the next step is that in the stomach, it is deactivated. Salivary amylase is deactivated in the stomach. So, essentially, no carbohydrate digestion happens in the stomach. The reason for the deactivation is quite clear. The acidity of the stomach is very high. It totally does not favor this enzyme. Okay? So that's what happens. Then the food moves to the next point, which is the intestines. This is where majority of the digestion of carbohydrates, they happen. And they are done by what? Pancreatic amylases. Okay? Pancreatic amylases. They now further break down the remaining polysaccharides. They break it down, break it down into disaccharides, different kinds of disaccharides. As we have those, we have three major disaccharides. One of them is maltose, quite all right. Another is sucrose. And another is lactose. Okay, so this lactose is made up of two molecules of glucose. Glucose plus glucose. Sucrose is made up of fructose plus glucose. And this is made up of glucose plus galactose. Okay, so these ones are called mono, mono saccharides, simple sugars. All right, so this one is usually called um, table sugar, sucrose. Why this one is called milk sugar, table sugar. This is called milk sugar. That's this lactose, milk sugar, sucrose, table sugar. So this is what they break them down to. And one important fact I need to understand is that the pancreatic amylases, they never break polysaccharides beyond this point. Okay, they never break it down to release monosaccharides. So what is the next step? What do you think happens? There are another set of enzymes called brush border enzymes. They are very powerful. Remember that we said that in those microvilli of the intestines, those microvilli, okay, the enterocytes, inside them, they have a lot of enzymes. They secrete a lot of enzymes, which are called disaccharidases. So disaccharidases, they can break even more than one substrate. They can break maltose and also break sucrose and all, all of that. One of the key 
characterizes the narrative that they can break more than one substrate of disaccharides. Okay, so they are brush border enzymes. So they are the only ones that are capable of releasing monosaccharides. That's glucose, fructose, and what? Galactose. The other pancreatic enzymes, amylases, cannot release any monosaccharide. They can't release monosaccharide. Very important point to note. So what do they do? They release the monosaccharides and then digestion is said to be complete at that point. So you see how digestion is very easy to understand. Just know the enzyme, know the substrates and each level, what happens in the mouth, what happens to it in the stomach, what happens in the intestines. And then the final point of digestion is always the brush product enzymes. All right? So after this break, we are going to deal with the absorption of carbohydrates. All right? Welcome back. So absorption of carbohydrates very straightforward and like i said all you need to know is the transport mechanism that is involved remember transport across cell membranes can be active transport can be passive transport and passive transport can be simple diffusion can be facilitated diffusion okay let me write it up just to remind you Active transport, okay, broken down into primary active transport and secondary active transport, then passive transport. It's broadly broken down into simple diffusion and facilitated diffusion. Okay, so we'll be pointing out the kind of transport mechanism that goes on. Very simple. Now, first of all, let's start. Every cell, every single cell in the body has this transport mechanism. It is the most common, they have the most important. And this, look at it here, ATP is called the sodium potassium ATPase. It is very important for absorption. Without it, absorption cannot happen. And you know, even in an excitable tissue, without it, you cannot have the membrane potential, none of that. Nerves cannot conduct. So it's very, very important uh, uh, um, active transport mechanism, okay? Called the sodium potassium ATP. It uses ATP. So what it does is that it takes sodium out. Now look at this place. This is the blood. You have the capillary here, okay? Here's the basement membrane. So it's taking sodium out from this cell into the interstitial fluid and this, this area, okay? And it's taking potassium in. So what happens is that it continues to reduce the concentration of sodium inside the cell. Sodium concentration goes, keeps going down. Now, the food that you have eaten, the secretions in this lumen, okay, they have sodium. Remember that most of the time when you eat food, there is salt in it. Salt, common salt, is sodium chloride. Okay, so you have a lot of sodium here. So what happens is that 
because of the activity of this ATP, sodium potassium ATP, there is a very low concentration here, which favors the movement of sodium from the lumen into this, this, this is a cell, the enterocyte, the epithelial cell, the enterocyte of the intestine now. You know, absorption happens of nutrients happen in the intestine, especially the jejunum and some of it, the ileum. Okay, mostly jejunum. So what happens is that it enters sodium, it favors it because there's a concentration gradient high here, low here. So, but what happens is that in this enterocyte, glucose in the enterocyte is higher than the glucose that is coming from this lumen. The brush border, they, they've broken it down to glucose. So what happens is that, but glucose needs to move inside. That's absorption. It needs to be transferred and transported across this apical or luminal membrane. So it's going against its concentration gradient from where it is higher inside this enterocyte. And it's still taking glucose to where it is higher, from where it is lower to where it is higher. So that kind of transport mechanism is called secondary active transport. And it is made possible because of this sodium potassium ATP that has created a concentration gradient that favors the movement. So the power, the energy to which glucose and not some other molecules as you shall see, the energy which glucose used to go against this concentration gradient is derived from the movement of sodium along its concentration gradient. So this arrow here is talking about this sodium. Sodium is going inside, okay? That energy here is very low. Sodium is very high here. So it goes inside. So the same energy is coupled to the movement of glucose. So here we write glucose. And the name of the carrier protein, this is a carrier protein that carries two of them. Glucose joins with sodium in this carrier protein and it tags along. Just like a car moving, and then you just jump at the back. A lot of people, especially these pickup cars, people jump at the back and move along with it. So that's what glucose, glucose jumps on top of this car where sodium is moving inside and moves along with it against its concentration. And that's why it's an active transport. Whenever something is moving against, it's an active transport. So it's called SGLT1, which is... Let me write it here. Sodium glucose transporter. That's what it means. Sodium glucose, GL, glucose T transporter. That's what it means. Then also, you have another one here. This sodium, but this one is galactose. It means that they use the same kind of carrier protein. Sodium glucose transporter, they are similar. Galactose, the galactose and glucose, they compete for who use the transport protein. They use the same similar carrier protein, okay? Then this, there's another one here. You see this other one here? It does not have two, two arrows. That means it does not depend on the movement of sodium for it to go. Okay? That, this one is called GLUT5, glucose transporter. This is called GLUT5, glucose transporter. This is called glucose transporter 5. Doesn't mean that it's transporting glucose. What it's transporting is actually fructose. But you know, glucose is the main monosaccharide, so they are, it's the typical monosaccharide, so they named it after it, glucose, but it's glucose transport 5, 
always be specific because you know you see another all these ones two two so you must be specific with this number group five so this process here is called facilitated diffusion because fructose is higher in the luminal luminal space in the lumen than in the cell so it moves from higher concentration to lower concentration so it's passive diffusion but because it involves a carrier protein it is called facilitated it's a passive transport but it's called facilitated diffusion all right so now all these three major molecules glucose galactose fructose the mono major monosaccharide they've entered into the cell now they need to before they enter into the blood to complete the absorptive process they will need to now cross the next membrane basolateral membrane into the blood and the transport processes they change instead of act secondary active transport now because it's now moving from the cell where it is higher now to this interstitial fluid where it is lower so it is now facilitative diffusion for all of them, the three of them. So this one is glucose, galactose, and fructose. They use a transport protein or carrier protein called GLUT2, the same. So why glucose and galactose use SGLT, which is a secondary active transport process when they come to this side to enter into the blood because it's going from higher to lower they use facilitated diffusion the three of them and they are all glued too so they enter into this space they now move into the capillary through bulk flow it's called bulk flow Okay, so when substances are moving through the capillary membrane, it is always bulk flow. When it's moving into the capillary, it is called absorption. When it's moving from capillary into the space, it's called filtration. Just note that. Let it, okay? So absorption, bulk flow, filtration, the same bulk flow. Does depend on the diet. So bulk flow moves it from here to here and Absorption is said to be complete. This is what you need to know. It's no more than this. All right? So I've written a book in gastrointestinal physiology broken down for you. So these things I've mentioned, that they are there. So for further reading to get a little other details, you can download the soft copy. The link is in the description box. It takes you to a catalog first for a token. And then other books in physiology too, that the link is also there. About seven books at the time of this recording that I've written, easy to understand texts. All right? So also at the link, at the description box, there you also see a link to our website. Just click it and you can get to know more about what we do to make those learning of physiology easy, exciting, and effective. So see you in the next video.